Hello, my friends. Today is December 7th, and this is Markets Weekly. I hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Over the past two weeks, markets have been spectacular. It feels as if the S&P 500 can only go higher, and on Friday, we closed at new all-time highs. So today, let's talk about three things. First, are we in a state of euphoria? Many people are asking this because oftentimes, euphoria comes right before the crash. So let's look at some uh, common sentiment indicators to see where we are. Secondly, some of the biggest news the past two weeks came from Europe, where we have political turmoil in France. Let's take a look at what's happening over there and why there are no easy solutions. And lastly, this past week, we got the latest non-farm payrolls report, and it's painting a mixed, though better than expected picture on some extent, but ultimately a weakening labor market. So let's take a look at the data. All right, starting with sentiment. So many people are looking at the stock market just going higher and higher, and it's reminding them of the 1920s. In the 1920s, we had a tremendous, tremendous bull market that was, of course, followed by the great crash. So many people are trying to figure out, is the stock market going crazy? Are we in a state of euphoria? So let's look at some sentiment indicators to see if we really are in a state of euphoria. Now, my favorite sentiment indicator is price, uh, because if sentiment is positive, then obviously price continues to go up because you still have people who are buying uh, stocks at high prices and thinking that they will go even higher. Now, if you take a step back, now we started the year around 4,700 in the S&P 500. Today, we're around 6,000. That's a tremendous, tremendous surge and obviously shows very, very positive market sentiment. And we continue to go higher. So looking at price, it's very, very hard to come to any other conclusion that we are in a bull market and sentiment is very, very positive. Another way to look at sentiment is through surveys. So a very common way is simply to a survey institutional investors. Do you think the equity market uh, are you a bull? Are, are you a bear? Are you neutral? Now, looking at one of the more popular surveys, you can see that, well, obviously, uh, the institutional investor community, there are many bulls. Now, even though, again, by plurality, there are more bulls, uh, it's not historically extreme. It is historically elevated, but not historically extreme. So by this measure, yes, sentiment is positive, but not euphoric. Um, another way to try to measure sentiment is simply to look at equity flows. Are a lot of people pouring money into the equity market? Now, looking at the most recent uh, fund flow data, it looks like there was a tremendous, tremendous surge of cash into U.S. equities in November. Now, that amount of inflows really stands out when you take a, take a look, take a step back and look at the inflows throughout the year. It looks like the the outcome of the presidential election really did unleash some animal spirits or at least reduce some uncertainty and made a lot more people comfortable in putting their money into U.S. equities. Another survey is not a survey to institutional investors, but to the general consumer. Now, consumer sentiment is not directly, uh, well, it is related to the stock market, though it's not a direct survey on the stock market. Looking at measures of consumer confidence, we also see consumer confidence ticking higher. Looking below, beneath the surface, you do get the sense that there is a strong partisanship bias where Republicans are feeling better and Democrats less so, but that's something that happens um, at every presidential election cycle, so it's not out of the ordinary. Overall, though, it does seem like consumer confidence is higher. Now, one other really important sentiment indicator is the amount of leverage in equities. Now, in the 1920s, when we had the Roaring Twenties, there was tremendous amounts of people borrowing and investing in the spot market. So margin debt was very high. At that time, interest and margin loans were as high as 12%, uh, much, much higher than the, uh, the Fed's policy rate back then. But even though investors were paying 12% for their margin loans, they continued to borrow because many of them felt that they would make even more money in the stock market and they weren't wrong. So fast forward to today, it's a little bit harder to get a good measure on leverage in the financial in the stock market, 
uh, because people don't really borrow on margin as commonly as they used to, and that margin debt data is not as easily accessible. What seems much more common today is to speculate using options. So when you're looking at, for example, some of the uh, more frothy tech stocks, you'll notice that the call implied vol for call options tends to be very elevated. Now that is an obvious sign that there is tremendous speculative interest. Looking at call options for the S&P 500 futures, what really stands out to me is that implied vol on call options is really low. And that tells me there's not a lot of speculative interest, at least through call options as a way of gaining leverage, uh, which in my view, if you are, uh, let's say, a institutional investor, that would be a more direct way of doing it. And at the moment, it looks like a pretty cheap way of doing it too. So that measure is clearly suggesting that there's not a lot of euphoria in the market. So taking a step back and looking at all these different indicators, uh, my sense is that obviously sentiment is very positive, but not euphoric. Now, to be clear, the market can still go up and markets can still go down. We have to look at many, many factors uh, to try to make our best judgment. But looking at sentiment alone, it doesn't seem like markets are euphoric, at least not at the moment. Definitely very positive, though. Uh, OK, uh, the second thing that I want to talk about is what's happening in Europe. So again, we've talked about this before, but France has had some political difficulties in recent months. Now, President Macron over there called for snap elections not too long ago, uh, thinking, well, I'm actually not really sure what he was thinking, but definitely did not like the outcome. What happened was that he ended up with a parliament that was, you know, not in his favor. So the election results led to a very fragmented uh, parliamentary situation where, uh, on the one hand, you had about a third of the people supporting right-leaning parties, a third of the people who are establishment, and a third of the people who are left-leaning. And so that made it very difficult for President Macron uh, to, to, uh, to govern. So he recently nominated a prime minister, and the prime minister came up with a plan, and the plan was to um, you know, rein in some deficit spending because France has a very large budget deficit. Now, that was very unpopular because both the right-leaning parties and the left-leaning parties in France are populist, and so they don't like cutting the deficit. They want to be able to help, well, at least give more money to the common person. And so uh, that budget did not work, and that led to a result of a no-confidence motion that passed, and so uh, it looks like the government uh, is going to, well, has fallen, and that leads us to a point of limbo where President Macron has to nominate a new prime minister who has to come up with a new budget that, that everyone can accept, which would be difficult. Now, that has led to some financial implications where you can see that the borrowing rate for France, so French, as French sovereign debt yields as a spread to German yields, has widened recently. Now, it's come back a little, but if you take a step back, the trend really seems to be very, very clear a whining where France, where it seems like the market is having uh, more and more concerns about France's uh, fiscal situation. Now, this is a problem that is not, that has been actually a long time coming and is not unique to France. Now, taking a step back, you can see that France has actually had a fiscal deficit uh, for a really long time, and so its debt has been growing and growing. Uh, the way the political system is in, in all basically Western countries, including the U.S., is that politicians step up and they, you know, they basically bribe you to vote for them. Vote for me and I'll give you more benefits. And uh, France is obviously well known for having a very generous welfare system. So how do you pay for all these benefits? Well, it's actually, if you are like the U.S., that's really never a problem because at the end of the day, you are monetary sovereign. You can pay for it by printing more treasuries or which, again, and if yields are too high, you can always, at the end of the day, have your central bank, the Fed, buy it. But when you are in Euroland, it's kind of a different situation uh, because being a part of the European Union, you promise to have some limits on your deficit and you are not a monetary sovereign you don't control the ECB. So in some sense, you're kind of like under the gold standard. So you can't really easily uh, just kind of print your way out of this mess. So 
how do you make those promises then? Well, another common way is to have growth. And so, for example, if you think about this in real terms, you promise a whole bunch of people a certain amount of goods and services. Now, where do you get those goods and services? Well, one way is to just tax. So take more from the people from one from one group and give to another. And that's kind of what they've been doing over the past few decades. If you look at a graph of marginal tax rates in France and in Europe more generally, you'll notice that they're very high. Um, and to be clear, these marginal rates hit, uh, these marginal rates come into force at, at pretty low income thresholds compared to the US. In some countries, you can pay the highest marginal rate at below 100,000 euros. In some countries, around 200, and in some countries, around 300,000. So that is much lower than the US, where highest marginal tax rates, um, about 37%, hit at around 600,000. And so they've been doing that for some time, just raising taxes to take goods and services from one group of people to pay promises that they made to other groups. But obviously, you can't keep doing this because ultimately, marginal tax rates become so high that you know, it's, it, 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 it actually impacts, reduces the motivation to invest and to work. So another way that you can meet these promises is to grow. And that's the place where there's been a lot of trouble in Euroland. So as we all know, growth in Euroland has been low, in large part because of low productivity. Productivity is the ability to create more goods and services out of the same amount of inputs. Now productivity, looking at Eurozone compared to the US, is, is really different. Now, productivity in the U.S. has continued to grow, in, in Europe really not so much. The biggest difference is technology. Uh, Europe kind of missed the technological revolution we had in during the uh, tech boom, and it seems like it's about to miss out on the AI tech boom. There's some really interesting work by a researcher at MIT looking at the amount of new companies started over the past 50 years that have a market cap of greater than 10 billion. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see these are the companies that fit that profile in the U.S. On the right-hand side, these are the companies that fit that profile in Euroland. So you can see that Europe really is, is not innovating as much as the U.S., and that's hurting their productivity, which makes it very difficult for them to pay off their promises using uh, an expanding pie. So going back to the situation in France and soon other Euro countries, how are you going to pay all your promises if you can't print and you can't tax and you can't grow? So this is a very, very, very difficult situation and there are no easy answers. And that suggests you know, a very, very pessimistic outlook for, for Euroland in the coming years. Now we see the Euro has depreciated steadily over the past few months. Now we're at around 1.05 and it looks like the ECB is going to continue to cut rates potentially a jumbo 50 basis might cut in December. And so that, that looks like it's, it's going to continue and there are really no easy solutions. Um, I think it's yeah, not sure how they're going to get out of this. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about is the most recent labor market data. So, you know, right now the Fed is really in focus about what's happening in the labor market. As we've discussed before, Chair Powell doesn't feel as concerned about inflation anymore. He's really focused on labor. So how is the labor market doing? This past week, we got the latest non-farm payrolls report, and it's painting a bit of a mixed picture. Now, as usual, let's go over this by looking at the details. Well, first off, on the headline basis, uh, the amount of number of jobs created uh, was higher than expected. So that's good. But looking below, though, you get kind of a mixed sense. Now, average hourly earnings, 0.4 month over month, higher than expected. But here's the thing, the unemployment rate ticked higher to 4.2%. And if you really go out to the third decimal place, it was actually very, very close of rounding to 4.3%. And something of interest is also the labor force participation rate declined a bit. So you have fewer people looking for jobs. So all in all, this is kind of painting a picture where um, the labor market is very clearly weakening. You got fewer people participating, and even though you have fewer people looking for jobs, the unemployment rate is rising. So uh, I think the market took a look at this and was marginally, marginally pricing in a little bit more 
of a probability of cuts, and, and I think that is the right solution. But we can also look at other survey data to get a sense of what's happening in the labor market. Looking at the common uh, Fed beige book data, for example, where the various regional Feds survey a wide web of contracts to get a sense of where they are, they're coming up with, with a conclusion that you know, the labor market is kind of muddling through. There's not a lot of hiring and there's not a lot of firing. So it's kind of a stagnant position right now, uh, which I, I think would be consistent with what we see in the just kind of lukewarm job growth data. Now, looking at other survey data, like the ISM services, you'll, you'll find that, yes, on average, because the employment component of the ISM services is above 50, that on the margins, there is some growth in employment, but it's not super strong. That is to say, only a small amount of companies are reporting that uh, they are increasing their employment on net. So overall, I think it takes it makes a lot of sense for the Fed to be more mindful uh, of the labor market. And we could simply be in a slow patch right now as we have, you know, the data could be lagging. After all, we have this election, positive market sentiment, perhaps the market is leading, and maybe that will translate to, to more job growth. But I, I'm thinking that the labor market is probably going to weaken faster than, than the market uh, expects, and in large part, uh, looking at what's happening in other countries that have surges in, in migration. And I think that's what I will write about in my post this week. Uh, Okay, so next week we're going to have a whole bunch of central bank meetings and soon we will have the Fed and then it's really going to be the holiday season. And at that time, I will offer my markets outlook for 2025. All right, talk to you all soon.